Next We didn't have this class on Friday from the Sikhs, so we're having it today. And uh, especially because it's so relevant to this month of Kislev. <laughs> so one of the things which is a thread through all the sikhs of the Rebbe from the beginning of time that the Rebbe took on leadership and only became progressively stronger when he started to talk more about Mashiach is that spreading Hasidus is one of the things that brings Mashiach sooner. So we're going to explain why. Why do we say that spreading Hasidus brings Mashiach sooner? What is the connection? Certain things seems to be easier to understand. Like when you say that Abbas Israel brings Mashiach sooner, yes, because the reason why the base Medish was destroyed was because people had uh, feelings of hate and resentment towards each other. So it makes sense that we have Abbas Israel, you're reversing that. But what's the connection to spreading the deeper secrets of the Torah, Hasidus? So it's connected with the story of the Baal Shem Tov. So there's a book, it's called Keser Shem Tov, which means the crown of a good name. It comes from Perky Ovos. And Perky Ovos says there are three crowns. One is, the, one is the crown of Torah, one is the crown of priesthood, and one is the crown of of crown of Torah, priesthood, and crown of kingdom, royalty. And then there's another crown, and this crown goes above all the other crowns, all the crown of a good name. So that's the name of this saber, Keser Shem Tov. And of course, it alludes to the fact that these are the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov. So the Baal Shem Tov has a letter that he wrote to his brother-in-law, and that's the first page in the whole book. It starts off with this letter. And he writes, I'll read it in English. So this is the, the third page here in this, in this little book, in this little pamphlet. And the Baal writes in a letter that on Rosh Hashanah of the year 1746, his soul ascended to the heavenly realms. He was granted the privilege of entering the palace of Mashiach. And I asked Malach Mashiach, Master, when are you coming? And his answer was, when your wellsprings will be disseminated outward. So those words are words that come from a Pasuk. You want to turn back to the first page. You see a, um, a Pasuk in the book, of, it's a copy from the book of Mishlei, Proverbs. And it says, your wellsprings will spread outward. I mean, generally speaking, a spring is just a spring of water. It's just one stream of water in this local spot. But streams of water flow. Very often there are rivers that the source of the entire river is a spring. The spring gives off water, the water flows, and it becomes wider and longer. And you have a river miles long, and who knows how wide, but it all comes from one spring. So that's what it means that your springs, springs and teachings of Torah should spread outward. On this exchange, the Rebbe Rayatz commented, from this reply it is apparent that the teachings of the Bashamta, the revelation of the divine intellect which the Bashamta and his disciples bequest us are very closely connected with the coming of Mashiach. And then he says a few words in Hasidic terms, what, how that's connected. So let's turn the page to get a little bit more of a connection. In other words, there are two ways to understand these words when your wellsprings will be spread out. One is, it's some sort of a sign. You know that when you're traveling and there's a sign that says uh, 100 miles to New York, 
The sign is nothing, it's just a piece of paper, but it's an indication that you're 100 miles closer to New York. The sign itself is not connected to New York City. When you say that when Mashiach comes, that spreading the wellsprings, that's when Mashiach comes, you can look at it as a sign when the time will come and uh, you will see that the wellsprings of the hidden secrets of Torah are spread out. That's a sign that Mashiach is coming. But from other sources, it's clear it's not just a sign. That's part of the reason why it's happening. That the spreading of Chassid is, is connected to the bringing of Mashiach. So let's say how. There are two explanations as why Panimus, did you see where I am? On top of it, you say 72. Right, there's a book called From Exile to Redemption, and most of the things here are coming from that book. Two explanations as to why Panimis Torah, the mystical dimensions of the Torah, was revealed precisely in these last generations. So as we know, there was a lot of opposition when it first came out, and the reason why there was opposition was because it wasn't studied before. In fact, it was considered off limits for the average person. Don't study these hidden secrets of Torah. <clears throat> so when it did come out and the Vashavta began to spread them, there was a lot of opposition. And there was all sorts of rumors. Uh, some people said that, that there's something wrong with the Baal Shem Tov and his teachings are really not coming from Torah. Others said the opposite. It's so holy that you're not allowed to study it. So the question is, why now? And especially based on the principle that, remember we spoke about this before, that um, in the secular world, it's believed that every generation is like today that we are much more sophisticated, much more developed than earlier generations. In the Torah world is the reverse. The further back you go, according to our perception, mm -hmm. they were great at tzaddikim. We had Abraham Avinu and Yitzhak and Yaakov, we had Moshe, the prophets, then you had those who wrote the Mishnah, those who wrote the Gemara, which means as the generations moved on, people became weaker spiritually, not greater. So that makes the question even more, if they didn't accomplish it, then uh, they weren't allowed to study these hidden secrets. How could it be that we are allowed to study? So there's two answers that are given, A and B. One is emphasizing something negative and one emphasizes something positive. Since the darkness of exile is thickening, an ever more brilliant light is required to pierce it. For this reason, the soul of the Torah was revealed, for this is what awakens and uncovers the hidden point of the soul, those faculties of the soul that are mostly deeply concealed. In other words, the reason why now is specifically for that reason, because this is the lowest generation, and where the darkness is so much thicker, and therefore we need something much stronger to pierce through that darkness. And therefore the hidden secrets of Torah, which were not known before, were made known now. In fact, there's a famous story with the Alter Rebbe that he gave a mushal. And I'm sure anyone who had any connection to Hasidus heard the mushal, but I'll just say briefly that there was a king and the king's son was sick, and uh, the doctors couldn't find any cure for him. And then they uh, realized that there is no cure for this illness. But one doctor came up with something, and he said there's one way that this child could be cured, and that is that there's a gem, a certain diamond, that is, has a certain property in it. If it would be squeezed and crushed, and he would drink the liquid of this diamond, then he would be cured. Only one problem. It's a very rare diamond. You can't find it anywhere. There's one place where it is, but you can, well, we can't do anything with it. Where is it? It's the crown jewel of the king's crown. You know, every crown has a lot of jewels on it. And there's one jewel, which is what we call the crown jewel. This is the main. So the king wasn't ready because that would mean sort of giving up his crown. 
And he urged them to keep trying other methods. Eventually, they came back to the king and said, nothing is working. And now his life is literally hanging. It's, it's just a matter of a small period of time and he'll no longer be here. Then the king said, take this jewel and grind it and make it into liquid and try to get it into him. So they informed the king that unfortunately it's too late. Now his condition is so bad that his lips are tight and he can't get anything in. So the king said, it doesn't matter, just do it and force his lips open, try it. Maybe a drop will get in and if even a drop gets in, that can bring him back to life and just keep trying. So the question is, wait a second, before when he was healthier and he would be able to drink it, the king didn't agree to do it. And now when he's in such a bad state, the king does agree, how does that make sense? But the answer is because it's the crown jewel and that's really the kingdom, you know, uh, if you ever read the books about kings, when they spoke about the king, it was the crown, like open in the name of the crown. This is a message in the name of the crown. The crown is the king. So to give up the crown is like giving up his, his royalty. He wasn't ready as long as there was hope to do it some other way. Once he realized there wasn't any hope to do it any other way, then he was ready to, to uh, crush the, the diamond and to save the child's life. The diamond in this analogy, I'll get to in a second, is, are the hidden secrets of Torah. And because these are very deep hidden secrets, it's very holy, therefore it was always revealed and accessible only to a select few in every generation. But that's at the end of the Gullus, now, and the, the times of the Bashemta, when the darkness was so thick and things were starting to happen that were because the, the gullus was so so dark and so thick, Hashem said, now take that uh, jewel. And even though we're at a level that we won't even be able to appreciate fully, nevertheless, the little bit that'll get in will bring them back to life. In other words, the hidden secrets of Torah will be able to revive us spiritually. Yes, Nelly. Um, this might be a premature question since we didn't read really yet. But, but <coughs> I knew you were going to say about that. <laughs> but like A says, we have this because we're like in our lowest state and this is to pierce the darkness. So that would mean that if we were in a much higher state, we wouldn't need this because we didn't need this before. Right. But like I can, and I'm sure like all of us can't imagine our life without Hasidus and like living life without Hasidus, even if we're like at our highest peak. So, like, so let's go to uh, plan B, the second answer. Yeah. Okay. Plan B, not plan B, but answer B is, is, a, is not because we're so low, but on the contrary, something so unique about our generation. Since we are now at the very end of the exile, we have been given a foretaste of the Torah secrets, which will be fully revealed only in the time to come. This foretaste serves as a preparation for the days of Mashiach, the main point of which is knowledge of Hashem, as the Rambam writes, the occupation of the entire world. We didn't learn this part yet, but we will be learning. With the Rambam writes, the occupation of the entire world will be solely to know Hashem, and the Jews will attain an understanding of their creator. In other words, the Rambam is saying, not only Jews, but even non-Jews, the whole world will be occupied with knowing and understanding Hashem. And the Jews, they will have something additional and they will be able to understand their creator, which is Hashem. So when Mashiach comes, what's going to happen? The secrets of Torah, which were never known, will be revealed. So because we're so close to Mashiach, so therefore we're beginning to taste the, those secrets of Torah. Like the analogy that's usually given is like it says in, uh, we'll see it on the next page. I'll wait till we see it over there. So the first of these reasons emphasize the lowly state of the latter generations. The second highlights the distinctive privilege, the fact that they've been found worthy of being granted a glimmer of the future revelation. Nevertheless, though they are opposites, these two reasons are interdependent for the quintessential power of the inner dimension of Torah, the Torah teaching of the Mashiach, comes to the fore in an ability to light up even the redoubled darkness of the days that anticipate the footsteps of Mashiach. So that means both things are true, that it's, that it's, a, it's, it's a privilege, so we're being given a foretaste, 
And the second thing is that this is also at the same time that the fact that there's such darkness, this will help us uh, be able to lift ourselves from this great darkness. But I think one of the things to recognize is not only that because Mashiach is coming and then with these secrets will be revealed, so we have them now also, but the learning the secrets now is something which is a preparation and it's a sort of a orientation to the coming of Mashiach. Learning the secrets of Torah now will lead us, will bring us to the time that we'll be able to learn these secrets with Mashiach. So that's the beginning of what we're explaining here, how spreading the teachings of Chassidus actually brings the world closer to Mashiach. Because the whole purpose that it was given was that we should study this, and through this, we hasten the time when it will be revealed by Hashem in a full full scale. So let's look at the second page, which gives an additional explanation. As the end of the exile draws near, our task is to furnish vessels for the revelation of the impending redemption. So you see, it's not just, uh, okay, Mashiach is coming, so we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're actually creating vessels. We're actually creating something that will help hasten that. Since in time to come, they will all know me. Now, too, we should in some measure anticipate this destiny. Simply stated, this means that everyone should exert themselves towards gaining an intellectual grasp of Hashem. Let me ask you a question. If you are going to a lecture on any subject, whether it's a Torah subject or even a subject in secular studies, well, of course, it would make sense for the lecturer to say, I'm going to be lecturing on this subject. And in order for you to be more familiar with what I'm going to say, read this chapter in this book or read whatever it says here in this article in this journal. So if you read it, and then you go to the lecture, you'll understand what he's talking about, and it'll make sense to you. If not, you don't have any background knowledge, and he talks, you might not begin to understand what it's all about. So the fact that you're learning it before is actually what makes you more prepared to be able to hear that lecture. In fact, what if a teacher might come to students and say, I want to teach something, but in order for you to understand it, you must learn this and this first, learn this chapter in Tanya, and then you'll understand it. Then the teacher comes the next day, okay, everybody ready? How many of you learned the chapter in Tanya? No hands. The teacher's gonna say, okay, we'll have to push it off for tomorrow. You can't understand what I'm going to tell you without knowing this chapter of Tanya. So tonight, everybody learn, and tomorrow we'll do it. Comes back tomorrow. How many of you learned the chapter of Tanya? No hands, I'll push it off for another day. In other words, the learning it before makes me ready to be able to receive it. Learning about this before makes us ready to receive the Torah of Mashiach. Yeah. So what, for example, would be, speaking of this, would be the reaction of someone who like has learned the Siddhis for so long and has like entered Mashiach science versus someone who has it and it's kind of just like their own face? There's a cute word from Chassidim which describes that. And he says like this, the truth like this, we're learning Hasidus and we learn about spiritual things, but we don't really have a clue of what it's really all about. But we learn a little bit. So the difference will be, and he gives a muscle. Imagine you're standing and you're standing near a wall and you hear a conversation on the other side of the wall. And you know, it's really not clear. You hear one word, another word doesn't make any sense. Two people talking, they're animated, talking about something. The lady, you meet them and say, what was going on? What was that all about? And, and oh, it was about this and this. Ah, now I understand what I heard this word. I heard that word. Now I see how it all fits in. So he says, when Mashiach comes and we'll see everything more clearly, we're going to say, ah, now I remember what I was learning that my about at Silas, at Tikka, Kadisha, Zohar, Malchus. Now it all, it's going to fall into place. But I guess if someone didn't learn Chassidus before, he won't be able to say that. Ah, now I got it. <laughs> but they'll get it then, yeah. No, in other words, it means that when Mashiach comes, we have a much more clear understanding of all these subjects. 
In the writings of the Arizal, there's a well-known teaching which is also cited in Halacha. And that is that on the afternoon of Shabbos, Arab Shabbos, we should taste something of the delicacies that have been prepared for Shabbos. So it's a custom. In fact, some people have a custom to taste from every single dish that's being prepared for Shabbos, eat a little piece. Some people have a custom to eat all the food before Shabbos. <laughs> then you're in trouble. Just the taste. What? The consume. What? But it says the taste, not consume. Okay. Right. You have to pay attention to what it says. <laughs> this practice gives tangible expression to the phrase in the Muslim prayer Shabbos. It says those who savor it will merit eternal life which means those who taste it will merit eternal life. Since according to the cosmic weekly calendar, it is now Friday. In other words, every millennia is like every thousand years is like another day. So the first thousand was Sunday. The second thousand was Monday. The third thousand was Tuesday. We're in the year 5,700. That means we already had 5,000 years. So what day in the week are we in the cosmic scale? It's Friday. Friday afternoon, it's 5,700. You know what I mean by that or not? Yeah. yeah. So in the Friday afternoon. So we shall already savor a foretaste of the innermost dimensions of the Torah that will be revealed in the time to come. And this spirit is written, and he will kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. That's Shira Shirim. And Rashi says, what does it mean Hashem will kiss us? What kind of metaphor is that? We have God's promise that he will... Hmm. Oh, it is, yeah. It will again appear to the Jewish people at Sinai and elucidate for them the secrets of the Torah, the reason, and its hidden mysteries. So it's in Rambam, but it's in Rashi also that what's going to happen when Mashiach comes, the deep secrets of Torah will be revealed. But still, we need a little bit more explanation. How is it by studying Hasidus? We're bringing the world closer to Mashiach. And also a little bit more explanation. If it's so dark, what does it mean so we need Hasidus? Why can't just Gemara, Halacha? It's all Torah. It's from Hashem. It's extremely powerful. Why isn't that powerful enough to help us overcome the darkness that we're in? What's specifically there about Hasidus? So the answer is like this. It says in the Zohar that Yiddishkeit, in a sense, all of Judaism consists of a chain, and the chain has three links. One link is Hashem, the other link is the Jewish people, and the third link is Torah and Mitzvahs. So Hashem is the first link, the Yidin are the last link, and Torah and Mitzvahs is which connects us to Hashem, three links. And the Zohar says that each one of these three consists of two dimensions. There's an inner dimension and there's an external uh, dimension. There's an inner deeper dimension and there's an external dimension. Just like we look at a person and we say there's an inner and there's an external. The external is the body. You see a face, a hands, a nose, and a mouth. You see the person walking, the person talking, but all this is external. What's going on inside, that's internal. And the truth is, even that's not so simple, because we know that what we think and what we feel consciously is really coming from a deeper place of things that are going on subconsciously. So there's inner and there's inner of the inner. So the same is with Hashem, the Torah, and B'nai Yisrael, the Jewish nation. That there are two dimensions in general, even though there might be many levels, but there are two dimensions in general. One is called the inner dimension and one is the external dimension. So again, to think of this Vagashmias, if you know something on an external level, you appreciate it a certain limited way. But if you know something on a deeper level, then you appreciate it much more. So if a child, for example, goes outside in the street and plays and finds a diamond, they have no clue how much this is worth. They look at it, 
and it shines in the light, and they're so excited. Mommy, look what I found. It shines. The mother picks it up and goes, ah, this is not just a piece of metal. This is a diamond. She's very excited. But she still has no idea what it's really worth, because what does she know about diamonds? Then she takes it to a diamond dealer, and he says, lady, you don't realize what you have it. This thing is worth tens of thousands of dollars. It's not an ordinary diamond. So here you have three people. You have the child who just sees something glittering. You have the mother who knows more about it, so she appreciates it more. Then you have the diamond dealer who knows exactly what it's worth, and he appreciates it even more. So everything in the world, the more you have an understanding of its inner content, the more you appreciate it, and the more you're attracted to it, the more you're excited about it, and so on. <coughs> so what Hasidus, what Hasidus really is, it's Torah, just like everything else, which is Torah, but it's the deeper dimension of the Torah. So when you learn the Chumash, the story of Abraham and Sarah, and now we're learning about Yaakov and Lavan and Esau, and the story is the way it's written in the Torah. But there's much more behind the story. And then when you look in Gemara, you learn certain halachas, but all this is still part of the revealed. The hidden is the spiritual dimension that's found in Torah. And that is the, what you learn in Hasidus and Kabbalah. Yaakov is really a manifestation. Not a, Yaakov is a, he personifies and he was the embodiment of this level of godliness. And Rivka was an embodiment of another level of godliness. And Roch was an embodiment of a different level of godliness. And Yitzhak was Gavura and Abram was Chesed. That would you learn and you begin to understand that everything written in the Torah has a deeper spiritual meaning behind it. That's why it's called the inner dimension of the Torah. So the term that's used is this is the body of the Torah and Hasidus is the soul of the Torah, the Neshama. And even the, in the Neshama, like I said, there are many levels of depth. What about us, Yidin? What is a Yid? A Jew, oh, a Jew is someone who was born to a Jewish mother or converted according to Torah. That's a Jew. And it means that they learn Torah, they do mitzvahs. That's the definition of a Jew. Anything else? No, that's what it is. Start learning Tanya. No, there's more to that. The Jew is a chelik, a lekami, mal mamish. He has a neshama that comes from chokhmah, vatsilas. and goes on to describe what the nefesh of the kiss is all about, and that this is a neshama that has all these advantages and how it's connected to Hashem on a much deeper level. And this is the deeper dimension of what it means to be a yid. On the external, someone who keeps Shabbos, someone who keeps kosher, he goes to shul, does the mitzvahs. That's the definition of a, a Jew who follows Torah properly. But according to Hasidus, it's deeper. And that's why when it comes to somebody who doesn't do those things, there's some people that say, oh, he's not Jewish doesn't keep Shabbos, doesn't keep kosher, doesn't do anything. How is he a Jew? But when you study Hasidus, you realize, no, that's not what makes a person Jewish. What makes him Jewish, is, and it's not just biological, what makes him Jewish is because he has a nefesh of a kiss. And therefore, no matter what they do, that nefesh of a kiss is alive and well forever. There's nothing in the world, nothing that can ever extinguish nefesh of a kiss. So it gives a whole different perspective of what it means to be a Yid. So when we say there are dark times, and these dark times uh, are challenges spiritually. So we have to reveal deeper strength and deeper uh, potential of the neshama that can stand up to the dark times. Because it's so dark that with the ordinary power that we have, it's a little bit like when there's a danger. What happens in the body? You have to run. Normally, you'll never make it. Suddenly, the person finds himself running so fast, he never knew he can run so fast in his life. How does he do it? It's called adrenaline. There's something that happens in the body that enables you to run faster than you ever would, or people have known to jump heights and bend bars and do crazy things <clears throat> which they never, ever imagined they can do. And they can do it in normal circumstances. But obviously, this is a potential that they had, but this potential only came out when there was an emergency. So in this deep darkness, we have to bring out the deepest dimensions and deepest strength of the neshama. 
So how do we bring that out? Because we're connected. So when we study the deeper part of Torah, what does it do? It brings out the deeper part of my neshama. In other words, in general, when a person studies Torah, it helps bring out and reveal their neshama. <laughs> but if I study the external part of Torah, it reveals the external part of my neshama. If I study the deeper part of Torah, it reveals the deeper part of my neshama. So in the time of darkness, which is the time we're in now, and we need that deeper part of the neshama to stand up against all the challenges by studying the deeper part of Torah, the deeper part of the neshama surfaces and we have the strength to overcome it. Is this understood? Yeah. <clears throat> I have a question. Yeah. So in Hasidus, if I'm not mistaken, there's a lot, a bunch of like uh, Jewish groups, like the bells and everything that are from Hasidus. So they're also doing their part to bring Mashiach from Hasidus? Yeah, they're also studying chassidus. They don't study a lot of chassidus the way we do, but they study chassidus as well. There's no group of chassidim. If they're chassidim, they study chassidus. The only difference is most chassidic groups study very little chassidus, and Chabad is studying a lot of chassidus. And yes, there's a difference. But everybody that's studying chassidus and following the path of the Baal Shem Tov is helping bring Mashiach. Okay, so we didn't get to that part yet. I only explained the part our learning Hasidus makes us, enables us to overcome the darkness of Golas. How does it bring Mashiach? So the answer is, we just said that there are three in the chain, Hashem, Yidin, and the Torah. So when I study Torah, I bring out the hidden part of my, of the Torah, and that's instrumental in revealing the hidden part of my Neshama. And the same is with the third chain, Hashem. Before Hasidus was revealed, people who served Hashem knew of Hashem, but only externally, not the hidden deep secrets of Hashem. When we study the hidden parts of Torah, and that reveals the hidden part of Manashama, because it corresponds, the next thing that happens is that the hidden knowledge of Hashem, which was hidden all this time, also comes out in a more revealed way. And that's Mashiach. That's what's going to happen when Mashiach comes. Right now, Hashem is hidden. If Hashem wouldn't be hidden, all the things that happen today, which are negative, couldn't happen. So when something negative happens, by definition, it means Hashem is hiding. Hashem is not revealed. In fact, we'll learn more about this, that if you would have to make a list of all the things that are going to happen when Mashiach comes, how many things do you think you can put on that list? Let's say at least 100. More. Well, we'll say that out of the 100 will be all the general changes and everything else will be subdivisions. But I want to say that all the 100 changes are really a result of one single change. And the single change is that Hashem will become revealed and no longer be hidden. And once Hashem is revealed, only all the good will happen. The Gashmi is, Baruchni is, and every level. Because Hashem is the source of goodness. Hashem is the source of pleasure. If he's revealed, there'll be only goodness and happiness and pleasure in the world. So by us revealing the inner dimension of the neshama, because we learn the inner dimension of Torah, that reveals the inner dimension of Hashem to be revealed and no longer concealed. And that's what, that means that by learning Chassidus, you bring Mashiach closer. Any questions? I don't know if it's a question, but it's like we're we're on this Friday afternoon with Eric Shabbos time, and you know Shabbos can come earlier as we're in winter right now, and it's coming at like four p.m. or it's summer and it's coming like at nine p.m. or something, you know. So, are we? Is there like um? Are I mean I'm probably there's probably some. Not no VM that have talked about this, like that it's like like what season is it coming in, or like are we or <laughs> so to speak, you know, yeah. like are we in the season of winter or is this a summer travel? The last time I checked the calendar, we were in winter. We are <laughs> like cosmically, are we in winter? Like, <laughs> No, later than 6,000. 
From the Rebbe, we understand that we're, we're already past that stage. In other words, like somebody said, the Rebbe came out with a global campaign that women should light candles because now we're, we're up to the candle lighting time. Right? Oh, right. Eight before, yeah. That started in the 1970s. And, and, and in fact, it says one of the reasons why women accept Shabbos first, women, they, they take in Shabbos 18 minutes before men. Right. For men, it starts when sundown, and for women, it starts 18 minutes earlier. Because regarding Mashiach, the women are the ones who bring Mashiach um, more than the men. We'll talk about that in a, in a later class. So I guess, being that this is sort of a metaphor, so very simply, it means we're, going, we're the ones that could make it happen. We're the ones that can make it be a summer Shabbos or Chas uh, or a winter Shabbos, which will be so much better. And like this winter where, where candle lighting is 411. So, you know, you don't have to wait much longer than that. But based on what they ever told us, we're way, we're already in the stage where, where we already see Shabbos, we feel Shabbos, and it's, and it's in the process of happening. Yeah. 3.30 Shabbos sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if this is too heavy. Maybe we can have like a meeting about it. But basically, on the topic of revealed goodness, we learned from Tanya that like whatever like bad things we see like, externally is just like essence of like insight like pouring down, right? So does that mean like in times of people loving them, will be revealed goodness, there will still be perhaps like tragedies, but like it won't be seen. We'll just see like the revealed goodness like in it. And it won't be it won't be any tragedies. No. Revealed means that we will perceive it the way we you perceive it as something good. So like a bridge could fall down, but it will be good. Well, no, it's like, or bridges won't fall down. Like, you know what I'm saying? Well, I, I can't, I can't, I can't reveal everything. You know that already. But the bridge falling down, not with people on it or cars on it or anything else on it, and maybe the purpose of that will be to build a better bridge or whatever. But generally speaking, when we say that when Mashiach comes, it'll be revealed good. It means the good that we know as good, that we'll see it as good, and we won't need to have any, any. Um, um, commentaries to explain it to us that this is good, we'll just see it. I mean, openly good from a human perspective. Because whatever you're talking about, we had enough of that for 5,783 years. So now we're ready for the second kind of good, which is totally revealed. Mm -hmm. And that's basically revealed good it means Hashem is revealed. That's basically what it means. If Hashem is revealed, we'll only see revealed good. So I think we had like a conversation about this, but um, what will happen if everything's revealed good, what will happen to like our emotions? Like, will we have, I mean, if it's all joy and bliss, like doesn't sadness have to well, exist for that? Or can joy like stand on its own with no opposite like emotional factor? Joy will could stand and would stand on its own. If you're worried about it's going to be a little bit boring or something like that. No, so the, an, no, the answer is yeah. that there'll be challenges, but the challenges will all be within the realm of goodness and happiness, which means. So we won't feel like other things. Like it'll just be like feelings of po like positive. Right. In other words, go like I said many times that the Mashiach comes, it's going from good to better. So emotionally, there can also be things which are exciting. And thing, but the the excitement or overcoming something, or overcoming challenges, can all be within the realm of goodness and happiness, but something happier and greater and pl more pleasurable than the other. But there won't be anything negative to deal with. Right. If there won't be any illness, there won't be any hunger, there won't be any fighting, there won't be any competition, there won't be any hate, there won't be any of all these things. Then what life will just be about pleasure and. If you're, if you're talking about emotions, so and maybe emotions need all these other things happening in order for it to to function in the way we know it. So it'll all be within the realm of good. And we'll be looking back at, at Gullis and we will feel 
uh, sense of like, like either regret or like, what is it, longing? Like we could have like been like doing more mitzvahs or what? what is that aspect? And how does that translate to feelings of joy? Like if we're looking back and- No, obviously it's gonna be a time of joy. Yeah. It's going to be a time of joy and not a time that everyone's going to be eating themselves up. Why didn't I do this and why didn't I do that? So that's the opposite of what the sheikh is all about. But what does that mean that, like, that we'll look back at Golas and we'll feel like a certain way? I guess that's a message for us while we're still in Golas. Telling us that we should look at where we are now with the eyes of where we'll be in the future, but not that in the future we'll actually be Instead of enjoying Mashiach, we'll be sitting and regretting everything negative that I ever did. Right. There are people who are worried about that, oh. and therefore they didn't want Mashiach. I just heard yesterday from someone that have friends that they just want Mashiach because you know all the negative feelings. They don't begin to understand Mashiach is going to be the happiest time in in history, and they're, they're not going. It's not going to be a time of negative feeling, and if anything, everybody will will be moving forward and moving ahead. So it's okay to ask for it, don't worry, yeah. yeah. What? There's a Chabad that was six million and the age of Mashiach, and it maxed out like the calculation of like what day we are in. So 99 was with noon. So we're like more than halfway. Yeah, we're definitely in the afternoon, no question, but I think we're past that. right now because I'm not sure if I'll be in school the rest of the day or what. I mean, let's do it now. Yeah. Girls, I'm ending the meeting here.